Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. Today's movie is Angel and the Bad Man, 1947, starring John Wayne, Gail Russell, and Harry Carey. I have known about this movie for a long time, but I honestly don't think I have ever watched it before. Perhaps I did on one of those lazy Sunday afternoons watching westerns with Dad. I'm glad I took the time to watch Angel and the Bad Man, 1947. The story was not the most original, but it had enough turns to make it work. I enjoyed the role that Harry Carey played, and the backstory of the beautiful Gail Russell was as fascinating as it was tragic. Even John Wayne's character had depth. The bad guys, led by Wayne's drinking buddy Bruce Cabot, were realistic. This movie should be added to your must-see list. John Wayne played the role of Quirt Evans, the bad man. Quirt is an odd name, so I looked it up. Apparently, it's a forked type of stock whip, which usually has two falls at the end. Now it makes sense. Bruce Cabot played Laredo Stevens. Everyone in this movie had great names. Laredo was a real bad guy, and he was Court Evans' sworn enemy. Hank Warden had a tiny part as a townsperson. It was the voice that made me notice him. Paul Fix was uncredited as Mouse Marr. We discussed Fix in episode 15, The Undefeated 1969. Pat Flaherty played one of the Baker brothers that Quirt Evans picked a fight with. We went over Flaherty in episode 40, Key Largo, 1948. Yakima Canute handled the stunts for this movie, and there were some pretty amazing buckboard stunts. Harry Carey played the role of Marshal Wistful McClintock. Harry Carey was born in New York City in 1978. Hey, I'm walking here! I'm walking here! But wait, what? One of the greatest cowboy actors of all time grew up in New York City? Wow. I'm shaken to the core. After attending a military academy, Carey turned down an appointment to West Point in favor of law school. Following a boating accident and a bout with pneumonia, Carey wrote a play. He spent three years touring and performing and did quite well. He lost everything when his next play bombed. In 1911, he was introduced to legendary director D.W. Griffith. Carey went on to make many films with Griffith. Carey's second or third wife, it's not clear, was Olive Fuller Golden, who we know as Olive Carey from episode 12, Billy the Kid Meets Dracula, 1966. These two were the parents of Harry Carey Jr., who was known as Dobie. Harry Carey Jr. was in the previously mentioned movie as well. Olive introduced Carey to future director John Ford. Carey pushed Universal Studios' head, Carl Limley, to let Ford direct. The partnership between Carey and Ford lasted until 1921, when the two had a falling out. Carey was the most popular Western star during the 1930s. In addition to acting, he would write and direct. Over time, he slowly moved to character roles. He was nominated for an Oscar for a small role as the President of the Senate in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, 1939. I always liked him in that role because he had a look on his face like he knew something that everybody else didn't. Carey had 267, mostly movie credits, from 1910 to 1948. So many of these are great, I won't even try to list all of them. A few of the highlights include Three Godfathers, 1916, The Prisoner of Shark Island, 1936, and director Howard Hawks, Red River, 1948, where he was able to act with his son. The movie is great because John Wayne's character is hate crazy. Watch it immediately if you haven't. Carey died in 1947 at the relatively young age of 69. When I saw Gail Russell in this movie, I thought, she's really pretty. I wonder why she didn't make more movies. Sorry, I ask. Gail Russell played, well, the angel, Penelope Worth. Russell was born in Chicago in 1924. Her family moved to California when she was 14. As soon as she graduated, she was signed with Paramount. They figured she was beautiful and they could teach her to act. She made her first movie, Henry Aldrich Gets Glamour, 1943, when she was 19. The next year, she was in The Uninvited, 1944, with Ray Milan. 
It was during this time that she started using booze to calm herself during shooting. It's ironic that she was working with Ray Milan, who is famous for making The Lost Weekend 1945 the next year. Kell's third film was Our Hearts Were Young and Gay 1944. The film did quite well. She was in Salty O'Rourke 1945, a gambler slash horse racing tale. She did well in that one as well. This was followed by The Unseen 1945, a haunted house story. Gail was cast in Our Hearts Were Growing Up 1946, a poorly made sequel to Our Hearts Were Young and Gay 1944, and it was a flop. She was in Calcutta 1947 with Alan Ladd and got her career going again. This gets us to the point where she was cast in Angel and the Bad Man 1947 with John Wayne, Harry Carey, and Bruce Cabot. She rocked it. She had a string of fairly successful films such as Variety Girl 1947, Wake of the Red Witch 1948 again with John Wayne, Song of India 1949, El Paso 1949, and Captain China 1950. In 1949, Gail married up-and-coming star Guy Madison. You may remember the ruggedly handsome Guy Madison from episode 60, The Command, 1954. If the two had children, they would have been beautiful. Following The Lawless, 1950, Paramount dropped Gail's contract because of her drinking and the associated problems. She only made one movie in 1951, Air Cadet. She didn't make any more movies for five years, and during that time, she and Madison divorced. Gail returned for Seven Men from Now, 1956, The Tattered Dress, 1957, and No Place to Land, 1958. By 1961, Gail was really drinking heavily. The Silent Call, 1961, was her last film. Sadly, she died on August 26, 1961, at the young age of 36. The cause of death was liver damage from long-term alcohol abuse and malnutrition. Story. The movie begins with a man in a gunfight and then fleeing on horseback. The scenery he is riding through is wide open and beautiful. It looks like the beginning of any John Ford Western, but he didn't direct this one. Eventually, the man, Quirt Evans, John Wayne, falls from his horse near Thomas Worth, John Halloran, and his lovely daughter, Penelope Worth, Gail Russell. Thomas catches Quirt's horse and sees that the man is wounded. Quirt is ready to fight, but the man wants to take him to his house to heal. Give me that horse. He couldn't go on. Nor could you. You're injured, man. Let us take you in the house. You got it going. Court demands to be taken to the telegraph operator first. Thomas and Penelope drive the wounded Quirt into town. Quirt and Penelope meet the telegraph operator, Bradley, Olin Howland, at the door. He wants to close, but Quirt pushes ahead. When Bradley finds out that the man is Quirt Evans, he changes his tune to a right accommodating fellow. My key's closed down for the night. Well, you can write it, but I won't send it anyway. Here, let me. Territorial Recorder's Office. Fort Lancey. Now file corner stakes on plots 234, 235, chart 1089. Record in my name. That's all. How shall I sign it? Court Evans. Oh. Court passes out into Penelope's arms as the telegraph is sent. Penelope and her father take Court to their home and send word to the doctor to come quickly. When Dr. Mangrum, Tom Powers, arrives, he pumps Quirt full of laudanum, an alcohol and morphine mixture. However, Quirt keeps flipping around until Thomas figures that he wants his gun. Thomas empties the gun and places it in Quirt's hands. Maybe we'll have to get something and tie him down. Are you crazy? It's empty. <laughs> That was it. A gun. It's a pity. It's stupid. These wild ones, I keep picking bullets out of them and setting their bones. Why? It's their destiny to wind up on Boot Hill. Court immediately goes quiet. The doctor takes the bullet out and patches him up. Dr. Mangrum tells the family they should get Court out of their house as quickly as possible. But they refuse because they are Quakers and believe good can be found in anyone and it is their duty to care for others. Finally realize 
that realism, untempered by sentiment and humanity, is really just a mean, hard, cold outlook on life. A frightened outlook. I stand defeated. And furthermore, there are times in this house when I feel as if I were living in a never-never land. But don't hesitate to call on me anytime you need help. Downstairs, Penelope asked her mother, Irene Rich, about love and how her parents met. Mama sees the warning signs. Penelope watches over Quirk for two days while he is basically in a coma. When he wakes, he grabs the empty gun from under the pillow and points it right in Penelope's face. While Quirk was out, he talked about Lily, gambling, killing, other women, etc. As Quirk heals, he really starts enjoying the cooking of Mrs. Worth. He and Penelope draw closer and closer. Back in town, the telegrapher Bradley is telling everyone that he is good friends with Quirk after their one meeting. This gets back to Laredo Stevens, Bruce Cabot, and his two toadies. These are apparently the people that shot Quirt. They come to Bradley and he tells them about the Quaker family that is housing Quirt. Audie, Penelope's younger brother, lets Quirt know the men are looking for him. When Quirt is aware of Laredo's presence outside the house, he jumps out of bed, dresses, and gets his gun. Penelope throws the moves on Quirt and he kisses her. She is madly in love and doesn't realize that both people don't catch it at the same time. The mood changes when Quirk realizes that the gun is empty and the cartridges are outside the house at the same time Laredo and the toadies show up. Hey, why don't we just bust in? Because busting through doors with Quirt Evans on the other side ain't my idea of a healthy pastime. Quirt sits in the dark and pretends he is armed. Talking tough, he bluffs, holding the gang off with his unloaded gun. You can stand right there against the light. Howdy, Quirt. You sure run a ring around me, all right. But you know, I don't think it was right friendly of you to beat me to locating that tract after my boys found it. Of course, I'm willing to listen to your side of it. I'm a reasonable man. Sure. Laredo's always reasonable. That's why he's the biggest man in the territory. You the biggest man in the territory, Laredo? So a lot of people say. But I hadn't heard. Laredo buys the tract from Quirk for 5000 cash and a note for 15000 The bluff worked. Quirt gives some of the money to the family, and he gets ready to leave. Penelope tries to go with him. I got places to go. Quirt, I wouldn't care. It doesn't make any difference to me how far. Oh. I know so little. I... I didn't know it could happen to one and not the other. She convinces him to stay. Court helps the family with their farm work and is very grateful for their loving care. He begins to help around the farm, although he comments that he left this kind of work many years ago. Court is respectful of the Quaker family's ways. The family is pretty anti-gun and they work on Court about carrying it. He hangs his holstered gun outside, never allowing it inside. Exposure to the ways of the Quakers starts to change not only gunfighter Court, but also the cynical, atheist doctor who is attending to him grumbling all the time. Court finds out that the water to the farm has been cut off by Carson, Paul Hurst, the farmer upriver. The Carson farmhands comment on how mean Mr. Carson has been and that he has a ball on his neck that is giving him great pain. You're getting mean these days, ain't he? Contankers by his natural borning. That boil on his neck don't help him none either. Court goes to see Carson. When he finds out it's Court, he can't let the water flow fast enough. Are you deep? I said, get moving, tramp. Nice dam. Yeah, what's that to you? Take out the top two planks. What did you say? The top two. Let 16 inches of water over there. Who says so? I do. Who might you be when you're at home? Port Evans. Well, take the top planks out of that head gate, you stupid idiot. Court takes Carson to the Worth farm. The Quaker family is genuinely kind to Carson. He is received with great love, and Miss Worth even fixes his boil. Their kindness truly changes Carson, and they become good friends. Quirt is the most shocked that the conversion is real. Penelope invites Quirt to go to Sunday meeting. Thought you weren't allowed to work on Sunday. Oh, Quirt, there's nothing we're not allowed to do. It, it's just that we don't believe in doing what we know is wrong. Well, that makes it pretty much each fellow's own guess. But each fellow knows inside. Well, there's a lot of gents I wouldn't want to give that much leeway to. As they get the team ready, a man slowly rides up on a horse, and the music gets dark. However, 
The man is Marshal Wistful McClintock, Harry Carey. He asks Penelope if Court has left the farm, and she verifies that he has not. I didn't mean to frighten you, miss. Is there a, is there a fellow named Court Evans around here? Uh, yes, I'll get him. Never mind. I can do my talking to you. Uh, has he been here long? Three weeks, I guess. He didn't, uh... He didn't disappear for, say, two days during that time, did he? No. Hello, you weather-beaten old hangman. Penny, this is Wistful McClinic, the Marshal of the Territory. Hi, miss. And don't let that gray hair fool you. He's a curly wolf. He tells the pair that when Quirt and Laredo fight, he will be happy to hang the loser. The Marshal then asks Quirt why he went from law-keeping with Wyatt Earp, became a cattle rancher, and then turned to crime. The marshal also says that Walt Enos was shot by Laredo after a gambler grabbed his gun hand to slow the draw. Walt Enos was the man that raised and named Quirt. On the way to the meeting, Quirt runs into his old crime buddy, Randy McCall, Lee Dixon. Randy goes along to the meeting to pitch a caper to Quirt. At the meeting, a young blacksmith that is sweet on Penelope approaches. Quirt gets the green-eyed monster. Randy wants to rob Laredo of some cows they are stealing from somebody else. The Quakers give a monogram Bible to Quirt and thanks for getting the water back. Quirt is overwhelmed and doesn't think he is worthy. He tells the blacksmith to marry Penelope and he heads off with Randy. Laredo and his gang of toadies murder some men and steal their cattle. Quirt, Randy, and their gang beat Laredo's men with long wooden clubs. I guess they didn't want Quirt to be a cold-blooded murderer. Now, selling cows that have been stolen by murder could lead to big trouble because it looks like you did the killing. Randy and Quirt take their ill-gotten gain to a saloon and commence to drinking it up with saloon girl Lily, Joan Barton, and one of her friends. Quirt is not being any fun. He dumps his gambling winnings on Lily and goes to pick a fight with the Baker brothers. It turns into a free-for-all. Eventually, he goes back to the Worth farm and he wants to get back with Penelope. They vow their love and they kiss. Just then, the marshal shows up and ask if Quirt has been traveling. He says he is patient and will hang Quirt in the end. After some more time, Quirt is in the field. Marshal McClintock sneaks up on his stealthy horse. There's a sight I never thought I'd see. Quirt Evans behind the plow. Only well, walks as soft as you do. I taught him. Oh, I figured you'd have hurt him. Except you were thinking too hard. Haven't you got some real important business to attend to? Someplace else? Sure. But I always like to keep track of your whereabouts. You know, Quirt, I always figured on using a new rope and hanging you. I kind of respected you. You never took the best of things. And all your men went down looking at you. Don't mind your own business. I usually do. It's a shame things don't always turn out the way they should. Now, that little gal should marry some young fella who'd know what to do with that plow. Why don't you kick up that horse and move on? Some young fellow that raised a lot of grain, cows, sheep, and kids. The kind of a fellow that she'd always know where he was. I have to run you off? Well, now, I'll tell you. I never have been run off no place yet where I aim to stay. McClintock says he had always figured he would use a new rope when he hanged Quirt as a sign of respect. But he continues that Quirt doesn't deserve a new rope because he is spoiling the goodness of Penelope. Quirt asks Penelope to marry him. She replies that he should go blackberry picking with her and her eyes make him leave the gun behind. The pair goes out on the buckboard and fills it with blackberries. Suddenly their day is ruined when Quirt sees Laredo and his toadies taking a shot at the buckboard. Since he doesn't have a gun, Quirt has to try and outrun the gang on the buckboard. There's a crazy off-road buckboard chase. It has jumps, hairpin turns, and steep descents. The team breaks away from the buckboard and it goes over a large cliff into the water. No CGI. Way to go, Yakima. Laredo watches for a minute, then leaves, assuming they are dead. Well, what are we waiting for? Nothing, I guess. Let's find a saloon. Court takes the unconscious Penelope to the house where the doctor is summoned. Get that doctor and burn up the road both ways. The doctor says there is nothing he can do except wait. It's amazing. The varied uses to which men put alcohol. 
To each different individual, it's either a stimulant, a depressant, or an anodyne. Just now I'm using it as an anodyne. Quirk believes his true love is going to die, leaves her, and goes to kill Laredo. The doctor tries to stop him. As soon as he leaves, Penelope gets up and demands to be taken to town to stop Quirt. It's a miracle. When Quirt enters the town, the people start clearing the streets. Quirt sends Bradley down to tell Laredo that he is waiting in the street. Bradley, who has been victimized by Laredo and Hondo, walks up and bravely delivers the message. Laredo sends one of his gang to the door to check. Then Laredo drinks a big swig of whiskey. Bradley mocks Laredo about the drinking. He also said he was curious to know how much whiskey it would take to build up your nerve to come out. You fixing to get your ears pinned back? The better pair of ears out in the street if you want to pin somebody's ears back. Yeah, you drink this. Sure. I don't have to stand near you. Bradley tells them that the marshal is out of town. As Quirk goes down the street, the worst arrive in their other wagon. Penelope is trying to talk him out of the violence, and he has his back turned when Laredo and Hondo enter the street. Quirt has already handed his gun to Penelope. As he turns around, the two men draw and are suddenly shot dead. <coughs> no, not Penelope. The marshal has returned to stop the murder. He found out that Laredo and his crew had robbed the stage, so he figured after Quirt killed them, he would hang Quirt. But since they tried to kill the unarmed man, the marshal had to intervene. Nothing ever works out right. I had them dead to rights. They got the Baker stage. So I figured I'd watch the ruckus. You down them, I'd hang you. Sort of killing three hawks with one stone, so to speak. The marshal says he is going to hang Quirt one day, to which Quirt replies, he is a farmer. It's only a matter of time and I hang you. Not me, mister. From now on, I'm a farmer. When the marshal finds Quirt's gun in the street, he tells Bradley that he is going to hang it in his office with a new rope. Hey, Quirt might need that. No. If only a man who carries a gun ever needs one. What are you going to do with it? Hang it on the wall in my office with a new rope. Quirt, Penelope, and the other worst ride away to the farm. World famous short summary Country Girl Lands Worldly Fella. If you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends, and if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show note to my site. Beware the Moors.